the colleagues uh, with us here, the Honorable His uh, Worship Mayor Kumalo, who's just had to rush out for other tasks, Deputy Minister Masina, again whom we have had to excuse as he's rushing to answer questions in Parliament. And uh, before he left, he had something to say about accountability, so I couldn't argue beyond that. Uh, Mrs. my colleagues, in the cabinet of Gozo Natal, Mabuya um, Kulu, Mrs. Lomo, Mrs. Belinda Scott, and Mrs. Klaba, and the Director General, the representatives of uh, Reverend uh, Jesse Jackson and the Rainbow Push Coalition, Mr. Gomez and other colleagues, the co-chairperson of the Growth Coalition, Moses Dembe, convener of the PBF, Derek Swanepoel, panelists, delegates, businessmen and women, friends, comrades, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for the invitation that I have received from the Premier of the Province, the Comrade Sadon Kulu, who, uh, who is the official host of this very important uh, conference, the Africa Economic Expansion Summit. <clears throat> Uh, we did have a, an indication that um, Reverend Jesse Jackson uh, uh, has a challenge being able to get here. Uh, there was earlier, uh, he was here about two weeks ago, invited in the Eastern Cape, and then he indicated that his mother, who's around 90s, uh, was not well and he was not certain he would be able to make it to this function because of that condition. So we do want to thank him in absentia, and we do want to indicate that the issue of the Africa Expansion Summit was a matter that was jointly discussed with the province of Kwasul Natal and Reverend Jesse Jackson. And I must also indicate that there has been a long-standing relationship between the province and the Rainbow Push Coalition, in which case a number of Delegates have moved from Guazul Natal to join various of uh, Reverend Jackson's uh, conferences in different parts of the United States. And uh, out of this uh, relationship, as a friend, uh, Reverend Jackson, a friend of South Africa, there has also been a long standing history between uh, Reverend Jackson and South Africa in the sense that he was amongst those leaders were leading the anti-apartheid movement in the United States and were also part of the civil rights movement where in uh, Martin Luther King Jr. was the leader and they were participating at that level. They have continued the fight and they participated in this civil rights movement particularly as part of the uh, matter of bringing about the issue of culture, the culture of human rights in the United States and link that together with our struggle for freedom. And, and therefore, uh, this rainbow, uh, this uh, expansion, uh, Africa Economic Expansion Summit, was seen also as part of taking that struggle forward, as I think all of us realize that that struggle for human rights, struggle for civil rights, and our struggle for freedom were linked together. Actually, those of you who know the history, the history of decolonization of Africa, uh, was actually part of the program of the slaves and the, uh, the subsequent generations of various slaves from Africa who wanted to come back home and some did go back home in the West Africa but others uh, of course uh, been naturalized citizens but this whole idea of uh, fighting for Africa to uh, reach uh, self-determination was a was an issue was a campaign it was a joint project of uh, some of the african americans at the time and some of the leaders uh, in africa Kwame Nkrumah, wb dubois and marcus Garvey, and many others and in fact the con the conference to talk about the liberation of africa or decolonization of africa was held way back i think around 1910 uh, in, in London where the African-American leaders and African uh, uh, leaders came together and then of course the whole movement uh, was given an impetus at that level. But that fight was not just, just about Africa uh, you know, uh, being decolonized, it was about helping 
the African people to get to a point where they can manage their own affairs and manage their own economies. And in this case, I always recall the words of, uh, in 1903, of uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, who had this to say, he published essays which he called the souls of the black folk. And uh, uh, in this he said, the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. Now we found this to be quite interesting as we attended these uh, uh, summits. Uh, uh, the last one we attended <coughs> uh, when I was uh, uh, um, joining the summit last time we were in partnership with our uh, Progressive Business Forum. We found it interesting that the issues that are being raised by the uh, black business in this country are almost the same challenges they do facing that the black African Americans are facing in the United States. But what we also found was interesting for us is that uh, these uh, forums that were being hosted did receive a lot of attention from African, different African states, particularly from the West Africa, where the West African uh, states, the provinces or states or countries mayors and governors, uh, you know, prominently represented this networking with uh, the United States and we believed it was important to make this our, uh, to make South African business also to be alive to the fact that there is a whole host of, uh, you know, stuff going around the world and we need to focus beyond ourselves, beyond our provinces, beyond our country, but we must focus on the whole of the African continent and also focus on what can be done with, uh, in partnership with various uh, communities that have got a similar history like ours, like the Afro-African Americans, as well as linking up with the global economies such as the United States and many other countries. And also working together as the African uh, uh, you know, entrepreneurs from the African continent in general. And we believe therefore it was important that we convene a kind of uh, uh, a summit of this nature to bring about this realization that there's a whole world out there. We must not find ourselves locked up just where we are, but we must look beyond our, our, our borders. Also, what I think was important for us is to be able to look back at ourselves as part of this Af great African continent and say we are living at a better time now than used to be in the past where you know, the continent was seen as a continent that was mired in poverty, in conflict, in instability, uh, with corruption. And it was a continent that everybody pitied around and then it was the subject of, uh, you know, all the aid and the support that they went around asking for. And of course, the narrative changed. When the narrative changed, it came about because the leaders of Africa took a conscious decision that they shall take charge of their own affairs and in particular deal with the issue of the democratization of the continent insofar as uh, you know the nature of succession in every country and I think we'll all be now aware that the AU took a particular position that they shall not recognize any regime that would have ascended to power uh, in, through unconstitutional means of coups and military takeovers and so on. And in this regard, this has helped to stabilize the continent. We do also know that most of the problems that related to the instability of various countries are not only an internal issue, but there was a lot of internal, uh, external interest in the, in the resources of those particular countries. But with the African Union coming together to focus its leadership, on improving good governance and fighting issues of corruption and, power and, and encouraging uh, uh, peer review mechanisms and focusing on the building of infrastructure, it has become important for us to, to say the, the real focus of the African continent now is about expansion of our economies, the growth that we should be able to uh, the, the growth that we should be able to register for the continent to continue prospering, but also how we integrate the economies of Africa, and we must realize that uh, Africa is one country, literally. And I, I said to my colleagues who were visiting us one day, I said, you, you know, um, you are here now, but if you had walked like our great-grandfathers used to do, you would have walked all the way, not across a single sea. So the issue of boundaries were, in fact, 
an artificial imposition that we must know we are one people. It's important for South Africans to remember that, that we are actually all part of the same continent and therefore our lot, our future, our fate is based on what happens to the rest of the continent, what we can do to build it and what the other parts of the continent will do to help us grow and this we are together on that and I think one of the important issues that we need to focus on is that on the, on the challenges that we face of poverty, diseases, illiteracy, unemployment in particular, the youth unemployment are the issues that uh, economic growth is supposed to address. Yes, there will be individuals who will in the process benefit on their own, but at the end of the day, the most important thing is that the resources that our economies will command actually are about improving the lot of all the people of Africa. Otherwise, decolonization would have had no meaning, fighting and de defeating apartheid would have had no meaning. So the issue of creating inclusive economies is the core of the matter. And this, I think, is what we need to be sitting here and talking about. Transformation, economic transformation, basically means that all the people of our country should in fact participate. And this particular image is an image that we must keep in mind. Now, we also want to say that uh, with all of this, the African continent uh, over the years has had this very uh, description of a hopeless, dark, gloomy continent has actually changed. And it's important to say that uh, the whole world is looking at Africa. And I always remember uh, last year where we were attending on a, 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 a Times a CEO Africa Summit, where in, uh, as we sat there, and uh, there was a huge conference almost the size of this one, uh, where everybody was talking about investing in Africa. And it, for the first time, everybody was saying, in fact, you get better growth in Africa than you do in any part of Europe. And that for me was a sign of things that have changed. But also the question is, is Africa aware of this very prestigious position in which it is today? <laughs> Being a, a, you know, a, a, a home of most of the world minerals and the good agriculture and good uh, you know, uh, tourism features and all of this, which are, uh, and of course, strategically located between Big trading, part, uh, 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 big trading partners in the West and the East, and are we aware of these opportunities that are now um, and are available to us now that the, the most of the political issues in the continent are, are waning, and therefore how do we take advantage of that? <clears throat> but I want to say that the world has taken notice of this, and despite numerous uh, developmental challenges, the African continent still remains an attractive investment destination Africa emerged as an investment destination for a number of reasons, including its abad abundant natural resources, widespread development of critical social and physical infrastructure, an increasing pool of well-educated workers in most of the countries across the continent. And therefore, these have actually uh, you know, uh, uh, been associated well with the, uh, the increasing spending power in Africa and therefore making Africa very attractive. And according to 2013 World Investment Report on Investment and Trade for Development, foreign direct investment flows to Africa increased by 5% to 50 billion US dollars in 2012, even though the global uh, uh, foreign direct investment had fallen by 18%. So, uh, but Africa was different. The FDI flows uh, to North Africa increased by 35% to $11.5 billion in 2012, and flows to West Africa declined a bit by 5% to $16.8 billion, $16 billion. Central Africa foreign direct investment increased to $10 billion. Of course, uh, the flows to South Africa, sorry, from, to Southern Africa fell sharply from $8.7 billion in 2011 to $5.4 billion in 2012. In the East Africa, foreign direct investment grew from $4.5 billion in 2011 to $6.3 billion in 2012. Now this for us is an indication that gone are the days of Africa as a continent that was seen to be holding a begging bowl, walking around seeking assistance, aid and donations. And through the Africa, African Growth and Opportunity Act, AGOA, over 97% 
of U.S. imports from 38 AGOA eligible African countries entered the United States duty-free in 2008. 97% of U.S. imports from these 38 countries got into the USA uh, from these countries. But also thanks to AGOA, the U.S. imports from sub-Saharan Africa increased from 21.3 billion U.S. dollars in 2001 to 86.1 billion in 2008. And I'm merely mentioning this issue because one of the things that we would like to encourage this uh, working together with the business in the U.S. is to be able to work on how do we maximize on this AGOA, which has just been you know, reactivated. And I think that uh, when you discuss, you need to start talking about how do you put together teams that are able to link up to the uh, DTI programs of AGOA, and also how do we link up with the rest of the African continent so that when we talk about AGOA, we should be able to say what are the targets for the continent, what are the targets between us that will help us to grow our economies using this opportunity that AGOA is offering. Look, we are living in a, in a global, a, a, a globalized economy, and therefore we need to be able to take advantage of any relationship that South Africa has with the, the, the different parts of the world. The investments in Africa represent on, not, only on, on, not only a cash injection in the region, but also significant benefit to the economy by improving socioeconomic factors, including the rising GDP, greater employment, declining poverty, better quality of life. And some of you would have noticed uh, last week uh, there was the representative from the World Bank who was talking about how South Africa, through our uh, social security network, we have actually uh, removed 3.61 people from uh, poverty over the past few years as a result of that. And so the issue of improvement of poverty with growing economies is a real issue that we must focus on rather than hoping to use aids and donations to uh, help to support poor communities, but we need to have our own internal resources to be able to do that. Most of the top Fortune 500 com companies are already operating in Africa, and they've been operating Afri in Africa for the past decades, and will continue to have the presence for the next coming decade. Companies from every continent and sector are stepping up their operations in Africa, and here we are pleased that we have got a number of ambassadors, a number of whom were sharing the you know, good stories to tell about the growth of the relationship between, between, uh, between, this, uh, between our countries. Uh, obviously, uh, I, was, I was talking to the um, uh, uh, ambassador from uh, Argentina. I remember that the issue was started a few years back to encourage import, particularly on the agricultural implements, and they were uh, telling me how that has already been successful tourism has come from Poland and the numbers are increasing, it sounds like very exciting stuff. And all of this indicates how much uh, we uh, you know, have opportunities to grow as, uh, as the economies of South Africa, as the, as the companies in South Africa. But you must remember that growth is about looking beyond our borders and that's really what we need to uh, bring into our own thinking as, as uh, business people in South Africa, those uh, ideas of partnership. So a number of sectors exist in the continent where in I think we need to look at partnership and growth. Agriculture, agri-processing is one big issue. Infrastructure is a big issue. Services, consumer goods, minerals, oil and gas, and I think all of us are aware that even in South Africa a huge amount of oil and gas is now being, uh, you know, has been pro uh, prospected and found in different parts offshore and onshore in terms of gas and so on. And, but this is also uh, happening in a number of countries. Mozambique is on, uh, currently building a huge gas pipeline that is going in through this uh, uh, to be uh, uh, linking it to a number of countries and that's going to make a huge difference in the economy. Uh, Angola, uh, Nigeria, Ghana, uh, uh, you know, all of these uh, have, got, <clears throat> have got a lot of the, of the uh, you know, uh, oil and gas uh, uh, you know, uh, operations that are going to be very successful, but same, similarly in the East, uh, when you go up to the Sudan uh, and, uh, you know, uh, as far north as the Eritrea and all of this, you are actually finding that Africa is becoming so attractive for, di for uh, investors from different parts of the world. The question would be how can business and uh, government play a role in harnessing Africa's potential 
And I think that some of the issues we'll comment about offer you opportunities uh, whilst we're also indicating things that will help is about how government and private sector begin to work together much more closely to be able to build the economy of our continent. Invest, investment in infrastructure, I think, is key. Inadequate infrastructure limits access to markets, raises the trade costs and reduces productivity, and thereby trade investment reduced. It is estimated that poor infrastructure in Africa reduces productivity of companies by 40 percent and, uh, and per capita output growth by about 2 percent points. The African Union has launched uh, its program for infrastructure development in Africa in Kampala in July 2010. The program emphasizes local ownership and is forward looking covering the period of 2010 to 2014. In fact, when I was talking to the uh, chairperson of the AU Commission, they were talking no longer about 2014, they were talking about 2060, which basically tells you that they are moving beyond a, a you know, short term planning, which I think is important for the continent to be able to realize its turnaround. It also brings uh, under one umbrella existing initiative of infrastructure such as short-term action plan on the new partnership for, for Africa's development, NEPAD, <coughs> uh, which is a, a long-term strategic framework and the AU's infrastructure master plan. If implemented as planned, it is expected to reduce the cost of electricity by 30 billion US dollars per year and increase uh, in access of power from 39% of the population in 2009 to 70% <clears throat> by 2040 and yield efficiency gains of about 172 billion US dollars from reduced transport costs in over 30 years and ensure that water, food and security results in a gain of 20%, 20 percentage points. And you must be aware that in this, in this case here, there's a huge uh, operation that is being planned in, the, in Congo over what is called the Great Inga Project which will be supplying electricity to not only South Africa, but to the nearest part in SADC and different parts of the continent. This indicates to you how, you know, uh, we're getting closely tied together by even the supply of some of our power sources, and it's important for us to always be aware that when such projects get to be successfully uh, um, executed, we need partners, entrepreneurs coming from all over Africa to work together for the benefit of our continent. Given the financial, limited financial resources, many country, in many country, uh, African countries, government also need to find a way to leverage uh, on the private, inv uh, private investment in infrastructure. What should private sector's investment be so that it should not be a responsibility only for government to be able to build this infrastructure? For, so for example, uh, South Africa and Kenya have successfully used infrastructure bonds to finance road projects. And these are some of the formulas that are being used. And, and Africa is already looking at all of these uh, best practice models to be able to expand to different parts of, parts of the continent. We need to then focus on how do we make more finan finances more accessible and less costly. Lack of access to affordable finance is a major challenge in firms in Africa and only about 23% of African enterprises have loans or lines of credit to 46% of the non -African uh, for, for non-African developing, uh, uh, developing countries. The lack of access to finance is especially serious for the small businesses because banks tend to target larger enterprises uh, and microfinance institutions focus on micro-enterprises whilst meeting the finance, uh, fin financing needs of our smaller business is hardly given a priority. And in this case, it's an important issue because to deal with unemployment, we need to increase the numbers of uh, small business you know, significantly. But for them to uh, grow, we need access not only to uh, financing opportunities, uh, skills and uh, training, but also to support as well as market access. And all of this means market access, uh, it means uh, big businesses to find a way of doing business with small business. And if you don't do it that way, then of course you find that uh, there is no way you can grow small business unless they are also somehow integrated to big business procurement processes. And these issues become very, very important in terms of how do we begin to talk about transformation of our own business. Uh, transformation also means looking out there and building, and building other small businesses as part of your growth. It's a new way of doing business. It's a culture that we need to, to, to encourage. Beyond the challenge of raising finance, it's also important to stem illicit financial outflows, and I had this was on debate this morning, 
and uh, it's, it's a huge amount of money that's being looked at that, that goes out, uh, 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 you know, a uh, huge drain on Africa, but also it denies the continent access to funds which would assist in productive investment and undermines the economic governance of various countries in the continent. This is something that uh, is being raised by the civil society as they are talking about world economic forums to say this issue needs to be given attention. But we also need to focus on the development of workforce skills. There should be a focus on the increasing of availability of good quality education, matching skills, supply and the needs of the labor market, enabling workers and enterprises to adjust to, ch to changes in technology and markets and anticipating and preparing for the skills of the future. And I think the issue of skills development is important, especially because of the advent of ICT. And without access to this or training in ICT, many people will actually not have access to job opportunities because most of the operations now are driven through ICT. Decent jobs and steep poverty reduction hinge on the diversifying of the economies from low productivity agriculture and informal sectors to high productivity sectors such as manufacturing and modern services. And these become very, very important, especially if you link it all up with the ICT for the young people in particular. We also need to strengthen mechanisms for consultation with private sector. African government needs to undertake regular consultation with private sector for a better outstanding uh, and understanding of constraints that uh, each, 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 each sector face on how to address them. And this for us is one of the challenges. You know, uh, South Africans are not able to compete properly in the continent simply because government goes that way, private sector goes that way, financial institutions go the other way. And when you get there, each one wants to try and negotiate a deal when everybody is looking for packaged solutions, comprehensive solutions, which can only be provided by government, parastatals, financial institutions, by, uh, and, 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 and uh, um, uh, enterprise, private enterprises, all of them together. And uh, most of the countries that are able to pro provide such a solution actually tend to perform better. And South Africans need to begin to learn to work as one entity, which is South Africa out there, is South Africa Incorporated. We must know one country, irrespective of the different sectors we might be representing. And the fact that we are not able to combine our efforts as we go out means that one person can't close a deal. If the banks are not there, you can still go back and consult your financial institutions. You are late. If your financial institution, in some instances, the power of government is to leverage the, on the bilateral relations between the countries, and therefore the participation of uh, state-owned enterprises is a logical in, you know, a beneficiary of that process. And if there's a partnership, with private enterprises and financial institutions. You can go, I've been into a number of countries where I find this to be quite an issue. South Africans, they believe in hunting alone. Nowhere in the animal kingdom does one hunter succeed. You work as a pack and therefore that's how you succeed. <laughs> Reducing trade costs is an issue, particular, uh, <clears throat> particularly in, in, the, uh, in Africa, excluding North Africa. Uh, we think that uh, this is a, a, a very expensive area to do business. And, and trading uh, uh, internationally as Africa and, and East Europe are those which are, tend to be higher in, in cost. Trade-related costs vary greatly in Africa, but are particularly high in landlocked countries and largely due to expensive inland transport. And one of the things South Africa, you know, I was quite excited two, three weeks ago when the President was here to launch Operation Pakisa because we've simply ignored the, the, the fact that there is next to us here a huge country which is almost the same size of South Africa, which is the, uh, you know, maritime uh, industry. And here you, you, you have South Africa with a huge possibility of being able to offer much of the transport to the rest of the African continent and we are actually being passed by. And these are the issues that we should be saying when we look at them are opportunities that are worth exploring. International Monetary Fund has projected that during the next five years, 10 of the fastest, 20 fastest growing economies in the world would be in South Saharan Africa. That's history. 10 of the 20 fastest growing economies in the world will be in Sub-Saharan Africa. 
and two will be North Africa. None will be in the developed West. African countries, the African countries need to embark on strategies to transform their economies through increased value addition in the primary commodity and to diversify into higher productivity employment generating sectors. Africa is on the move and will, re will reach a great height, provided that it has strong committed leadership, unrelenting uh, national and regional efforts, dynamic private sector and sustained support from the international community. And Africa can make faster progress and, and take its rightful place in a globalized world. Now, summits like this offer opportunities to learn from others so that you don't have to repeat the mistakes and that's the quickest way of moving forward. And I believe therefore when we are here, we are about sharing views and, exp and experiences and say, looking at how we can improve without having to suffer the uh, pain of having gone back uh, uh, to, to, the, to the mistakes that other, other people would have done <clears throat> in the past. So industrialization and building capacity for manufacturing and value addition to produce both for domestic and consumption and export for, 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 for domestic consumption and export is what we should be aiming at. This idea of having to import literally everything that I've ever has spoken about this uh, um, you know, uh, 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 problem of the balance of uh, so much import as opposed to how much we export. <coughs> Uh, even food now in, in this, this country, you know, and like net uh, import on many of the food stuff which we are capable of producing ourselves. The idea should be how to produce for our own uh, domestic consumption and therefore go out to export. African uh, consumption is growing <clears throat> and here we are looking at almost a billion, a billion people market, particularly with uh, younger people with the rising numbers of the middle class with growing economies, we have a possibility, of course, of growing incomes and improving lifestyles. And this means that on our own as the African continent, we actually can go a long way to helping the economies of our countries to grow together. And I think it's important for us to understand that uh, uh, South Africa alone should not be the, seen as the end of business activity. And we must also understand that the message for South Africa is that business must focus on how to grow and be part of the regional African economy. The future is about the integration of the African economy. A few months ago I was in, in Nigeria and I asked to see a number of uh, South African business people. There was a young, a young guy who, who said to me he's been in Nigeria now for about 10 years. And I said, what message should I take home? And he said to me, simple. Anyone who is in business in South Africa and is not in Nigeria and is not about to be in Nigeria is not serious about their business in South Africa. <laughs> and when I listened to that, I said to myself, maybe this message needs to be amplified. Because there are many companies in the world that are looking at South Africa as a base from which to, to, to spring into the rest of the continent. Now we need to utilize that because what the advantage is of South Africa is a very strong systems, a legal system, financial institutions, and the ease of doing business and the reliability of the repatriation of uh, profits is very stable in South Africa, including you know, as much as we are talking about corruption, but in fact, this country is one of those where you still uh, have got a lot of transparency and accountability and democracy that allows for processes of procurement, for processes of uh, you know, business interactions to be challengeable in any court of law, which therefore means that the safety of any business investment is assured. That's what most of the investors are looking for. But not only that, we've got academic institutions, we've got a high level of development and technological advancement that if any company based itself in South Africa and expanded into the rest of the continent, everyone else there, out there in the continent are wanting to do business with South Africa. They just want South Africans to come and partner. Sometimes the culture of doing business in South Africa, we misunderstand it because we're linked to the systems of the West so they tend to be very aloof and sometimes arrogant, and I think South Africans have been quite often accused of that. 
kind of know it all, have it all. I think this we need to understand. These are some of the things that we need to change as we move over. Because out there, what's important is for people to be able to partner and grow together with the, the, the South African institutions. And so we need to be partnering in institutions, in, in organizations, in companies, in such a way that uh, you know, uh, when we move out, we add value where we go. <clears throat> it's not so much that it's all about us. It's all about how we partner and grow together with the rest of the continent. And this is the message that I think is, is very, very important for South Africa. And therefore, you offer South Africa as really an asset from which you can benchmark, but not that South Africa would necessarily be the biggest and the only growth center in the, in, in the continent. There will have to be many growth centers in the whole continent. And if that happens, it means Africa is growing. And you can't start thinking you can compete with any other part of the, of the, of the, country, of, of the continent. If Nigeria grows and is being benchmarked as a bigger economy, and so be it. If Kenya is growing at a rate higher than South Africa, so be it. If Ghana is growing, so be it. But the point is that it means for the first time, the whole of, African, of the African continent is now attractive to investment. And that's what we need. And it's all about growing together. It's about partnership. It's about how do we make sure that when we grow, other parts of the continents will also grow. Or put it the other way, when they grow, they will grow with us. And this is what we need to be really looking at. And so the culture of doing business in South Africa has to change. It has to be inclusive. It has to be transformative. And there's no way you can have a white company that moves from the South, the South Africa to become a white company in Nigeria or in Ghana. You must be a South African company when you get there so that you can partner with those who are there as an African company. And this is the point when we talk about radical transformation. We're saying you have to make sure that there is inclusivity, there is broadening of participation in South Africa, but you can't then expect to be, expect to be uh, you know, welcome in different parts of the continent when you want to be exclusive in South Africa, uh, but you want to be welcomed on the other side. You need to know that African people have all come from a similar background. They need to be partnered with, they need to be empowered, they need to be grow. we need to grow together. And if we grow together, we will then be able to take this continent to where it's supposed to go. And the point, therefore, that we're making, the point that we are making is that let's stop focusing inwards. We are part of a greater continent that will offer more than what you can find inside. But when you get there, let's be humble. Let's be like every other person. You get into somebody's house, you must know you are in somebody's place. And therefore, you must partner, you must respect their rules, you must respect how they do business. Actually, I say this because I found it interesting. It, doing business in the West and doing business in the East is not the same. You can't go anywhere into the Gulf States and think yet you can just go into you know, a desktop study, do a feasibility study, and then go in and go and invest, and you've got nothing to do with the Sheikh or the, uh, or, or, or the, or, or the Emir in charge. There you have to go to the main boss and you, you, you do your business on the basis of how, how that country works. In the West, you can go into the uh, you know, uh, internet and do a, 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 a due diligence and then decide to invest in a company based on what the, show, show, the shares are showing on the stock exchange, not even worrying, you may not even have met the chairman of that company, least of all to worry about who's the president of the country. But you can't do that in Africa. Here in Africa, the systems are not quite as developed in the whole rest of the world, and therefore the political, uh, the political management and economic management is still fairly closely linked together. And therefore, there has to be an understanding that you are coming here to add value to what the whole economic and, and political governance is about in the particular country. But if you think you're going to walk in there because in South Africa we're a free country and therefore you can walk in and out, this is why a lot of South Africans have bent themselves. And the point we're making to us is that let's just be a bit more humble, but let's go out there to build partnerships, but also saying that our institutions must work with us on that, in that regard. With that, I wish you everything of the best, and from the behalf of the uh, Progressive Business Forum, we'd like to say to you, we wish you a, a happy conference. Thank you very much.